All right, awesome. Yes, kicking off WordCamp, so excited to be here from Brisbane. So thank you to the organisers for having me. Um, just quickly, a little bit, just to give you some background. Yes, my name's Jen, and I am the founder and fearless leader of Pixel Palace. Uh, Pixel Palace is an agency in Brisbane. Um, we specialise in custom WordPress and strategic marketing. So um, we're a team made up of myself, project manager, um, designers, devs, um, and then the marketing team, which is like uh, strategic marketing, social media, ads, and publicity. Um, we, I started building websites in 2000, oh God, I don't know, early 2000s, um, and that gives my age away, um, but today we specialise in custom WordPress, like I said, we've got clients like RSPCA, we've done quite a few big um, custom WordPress sites for RSPCA, including their big RSPCA approved directory site, and we're currently in the middle of another campaign site for their cat safety department as well, which is pretty cool. Women's Agenda is another big one of ours that we're currently in the middle of a rebuild on as well. Um, we've done quite a few big sort of travel sites and multilingual custom travel things in WordPress over the years. Um, so yeah, we're currently a team of seven, um, but by next year we'll probably be nine at the rate that I am traveling. Um, but it wasn't always this way. So who here in the audience is a freelancer? Oh my God, heaps of you, awesome. Um, and who else, if you're not a freelancer, do you deal with clients daily in some way? People, yeah, yeah, so business owners. Cool, so just to give you a bit of background on me personally and my story, I started in web after my music career ended. Um, so in my mid, for my whole life, from when I was a little girl, I, all I wanted to be was a pop star and a singer. Um, and by the time I hit my 20s, that dream was kind of coming true for me. Um, in the early 2000s, I was a one-hit wonder here in Australia. Um, you can Google that later. Um, <laughs> it's a good party story, basically. Um, but anyway, yeah, um, made no money from that. Actually, I spoke at Brisbane WordCamp a couple of years ago on humanizing your brand, and I told my whole story in detail. Um, it's up on WordCamp TV if you're really interested. It's quite the tale. Um, but I made no money, um, despite having a really big song that I co-wrote and produced and performed. Um, but anyway, we had a website made for the band. The record company made a website, which was really cool. Like in the late 90s and early 2000s, it was a new thing. So had a website, but we had no budget to update it. They wouldn't pay for anything else. So I lived with my brother at the time, and he, was, he worked for IBM. He was a bit of an IT guy. So he and I got Dreamweaver, and we decided we were going to learn HTML, and we were going to update this thing ourselves. Um, and that was the first kind of moment where I started falling in love with the web and the fact that you could connect and communicate. Um, for me, as an artist at that time, there was no way to really talk to fans. There was no social media. There was none of that. Um, so the website was the one bit where I could talk directly to people about what I was doing um, and share myself with fans. So when that all fell in a steaming pile of poo, um, I needed a new career and I had literally no skills. All I'd done was sing my whole life and perform. Um, so I was like, what am I going to do now? And I thought, I'll go study web. And so I started basically on the journey I am now. Um, I started with doing sites for friends, and I was actually building Adobe Business Catalyst sites at the beginning. Um, and I was just doing it from my bedroom at home, working it out as I went. Um, and then I had a friend who I'd met in my music career. She worked at B105 in Brisbane, the radio station, and she was going to move to LA to become an entertainment reporter. So she was like, can you build me a site? I need a site. So I did. And she went off to LA and then started making a name for herself. And in the process of that, started referring people to me from LA. So I went from really puttering around in Brisbane to suddenly having all of these LA-based clients that were... Um, celebrity stylists, fashion labels, um, all sorts of really, really cool clients on my portfolio. I wasn't very good. Um, but uh, clients really loved me because I was super people pleaser, I was friendly, I was attentive, I was super responsive, and I communicated really well. So the business grew. Um, and as it did, it became harder and harder to manage on my own from my bedroom. With, I'd had two babies in this time as well, so I'd had little kids. Um, and being the people pleaser and um, 
prone to some anxiety. I was um, wait, finding myself waking up and I'd jump on the computer straight away in my pajamas, walk out, sit down, and people probably relate to this. My husband would bring me a coffee, I'd sit down, I'd be working, 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 and it'd be 2 p.m. before I stood up and realised I hadn't eaten and I'd had a coffee and I hadn't moved. Um, and this got into a really, really, really bad cycle of not taking care of myself. Um, I had things like a client text me at 11 p.m. when I was asleep and I heard it go off, so I got up and the site's down, so I get out of bed, go and get on the phone to the host for hours to fix it, get the site back up. I'm sure everyone's been here as well. Um, and it just got so bad that I was waking up sick from stress. Um, my husband intervened at that point and made me go and see someone and I got diagnosed with really severe clinical anxiety um, and medicated. So at that point, it was like, something's got to change. I've either got to scale or I've got to quit. I can't keep this up. But I love, I love what I do, and I loved what I did then. So I was like, nope, not doing that. And that was when I first decided to get another person involved, and I got a contract developer on board who just would take over all the dev side and take it off me, and I would just deal with design and clients. And then the business grew from there. So like I said, today, Pixel Palace, 12 years on, nearly 13, and we're a team of seven, eight, there's a couple of part-timers. Um, and when I was brainstorming um, what to talk about at WordCamp with my team, um, they all commented that after the last Prezos, at all the previous WordCamps, um, well, I presented on all sorts of things. I've done um, case studies on our custom WooCommerce that my husband and I built, and that's now the coffee empire. <laughs> um, and I, last, last one in Brisbane, I did what goes into a 50K plus WordPress site, so custom stuff, and showcase some of the custom work that Pixel Palace does on some of these sites. And that was great, but there were heaps of questions always in, in the Q&A and afterwards around the stuff I talked about with clients and the client manager and the people side of things. Um, people really wanted to hear about the secret source of navigate, successfully navigating, running a profitable, fun, creative, or tech business. Um, so that's what I'm going to talk about today. Um, my team will tell you that we have a fantastic culture at Pixel Palace, and I am super proud of that and really, really conscious of it. It's my number one driver in my business is actually people and my team. We have really clear mission and values, and I protect this fiercely. Um, I do that by using the things I'm going to talk about today. Um, so I think it's really going to be relevant to anyone who's running a business in this space, hopefully, whether it is just you on your own or whether you've got some team on board or if you're just client-facing in a bigger organisation. Right, so... Number one, first point, and this is the biggest one, I think, in my book, it underpins everything, is that it all comes down to people um, and communications. So if you are not good with people and communications, I really believe you need to learn it or you need to hire someone who is. Um, you can be the best designer, coder, tech person in the world, but if you can't communicate and manage people, then it's going to be a struggle to have a business in this space. Um, you know, people, are, it's easy to get obsessed with um, code and tech or mega design and blah, 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 but really it just comes down to people and relationships. Um, so, some tips around people, some things that you might be able to take away and use are tailoring your communication style to clients. Um, so, I do this up front. I rec try to recognise how certain clients, when they come on board, need to be communicated with. Um, find out what's important to them. So some people really want details when it comes to web, um, or some just want big picture, like they don't really want to get bogged down, they just want you to take care of it. Um, some people need to feel in control, and others want you to feel safe. They want you to be in control. So if you can identify that early in all your communications with a client, things will run a lot smoother, and they'll be a lot happier, and they'll give you less grief. Um, so um, it's awareness around how people need to be communicated with. Get comfortable with uncomfortable conversations. Um, this is a good one. I actually love an uncomfortable conversation now. I've become a sicko for it. Um, when I first started, I didn't. I don't think many humans do actually like it. But if you can get comfortable with this, it's a superpower with people. Um, things get sorted out super quick. Get on the phone and have the uncomfortable conversation and sort stuff out quickly. Further to that. Call, don't email around those difficult conversations. Someone on, multiple people on Facebook tagged me on that meme, 
um, because I'm apparently the person in yellow with every one of my designer or um, developer friends. Um, because I truly believe, I, I see so many of my friends that I talk to um, that are in this space, they're like, oh, these clients drive me crazy. Um, and I'm like, just call them, just call them. Things escalate on email, right? Like, people are keyboard warriors and it, people are happier to fire back some unreasonable thing or not think about their tone. And you'll read into their tone on an email. Um, but honestly, I find when you get on the phone, it diffuses so quick. Um, more often than not, okay, occasionally it might not, but mo more often than not, it will diffuse. So, um, and then importantly, follow up that email, uh, follow up that call with an email outlining what you talked about. So there is a written document of what was discussed. Um, it's also a really professional way to finish up a conversation that might have been difficult. Um, yeah. Point two, your ego will kill you in this space. Um, one of the biggest ways we shoot ourselves in the foot is by letting our ego dictate actions and how we think and feel about ourselves and others. So managing your ego and keeping it in check is literally one of the most productive and rational and magnetic and attractive things you can do in this space. It's the ultimate sales tool. Um, putting ego aside will allow you to listen, which is super important. Um, it will also help you improve sales conversions. Like when people feel heard, especially in those initial conversations, um, it can be quite um, unusual in the space, like really, really listening without ego. Um, it helps you produce better work because you can put aside ego and not just have your agenda, but actually do good work for clients that will make a difference. Um, and you'll just generally have happier clients overall. So my tip on this, especially around getting client feedback on something, um, particularly if you're a bit sensitive, um, is you know, if a client sends you feedback, you have to not take things personally, put your ego aside and ask where's the truth in their perspective? Um, what is it I can take from this feedback that will be useful and better the outcome in this project? And what do I need to just leave on the table because that's just their perspective and it's um, subjective and blah, 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 blah. But if you can get good at putting your ego aside, all this stuff will get easier. Further to that, as a part two on um, ego, is empathy. Um, so empathy is the act of putting yourself in someone else's shoes and seeing a problem from their point of view. So I believe empathy is a superpower in this space um, because it lets you kind of predict things. Like, I am able to predict a client's questions before they ask them usually now and proactively answer them, which is, again, an amazing sales tool. Um, but also throughout the project, if I know, if I have empathy for where they stand, I can understand why they're asking questions and what they might ask before they do it. Um, it'll help you predict what they're going to feel when they get the link to the staging site or they get the design or they get whatever it is, the quote, whatever it is. If you've had empathy about their point of view on the whole thing, you're going to be able to know before you send it what they're going to think when they see it. Uh, and then understanding what's driving their reactions and their feedback and their behaviour. So, you know, some people just behave badly or are in a bad place and that comes as feedback to you when you send them something or for whatever reason, but having some empathy about where they currently stand in their life or their point of view will give you some buffer around um, that stuff, which is the things that freelancers in particular take to heart. I believe you can learn empathy, absolutely, but you absolutely have to put ego aside to do it. So these two go hand in hand for me. So a tip around empathy is, I don't know, how many people have heard of Brene Brown? Yeah. Oh my God, so yeah, here's, here's a tip. If you haven't got into Brene Brown, you need to. Go and have a listen to some of her stuff. She's amazing. I literally want to be besties with Brene. Um, but she has this awesome idea of the assumption of positive intent. Um, which is this idea of approaching every interaction with people or clients, I use it for clients, but people in general, with an assumption of positive intent, which means you assume that they're doing the best they can. So, yes, that client might be an absolute dick. Like, that's sometimes what happens. Like, they might be, but if you have assumption of positive intent, they're not meaning to be. They're not deliberately trying to make your life hell. They're just having a bad day, or this is very stressful for them, or their boss is really putting a deadline on them, or whatever it is. It doesn't make it right, but it makes it easier, and it gives you a little bit of buffer. So, the assumption of positive intent is a really good one to take and move forward with in your interactions with clients. 
Number three is you need to get picky. I am so picky about clients at Pixel Palace. I've actually always been pretty picky um, about who I've worked with over the years. Um, we make clients kind of run the gauntlet at Pixel Palace. It's more of an application than it is an um, inquiry. Um, so better clients demand more from you, but they pay more and they talk about your work. Um, better clients will make it easier for you to level up and better clients will challenge you to dig deeper and do more of what you're capable of. So I don't believe you can do better by working more hours. Um, you, you just can't work more hours, but you can do better by finding better clients. Um, so how do you do that? Um, we have some things that in our book will be a tick against the good client um, score at Pixel Palace. Um, the first one is having budget. Um, now, this is a big one because although on the surface, of course, clients with budget, yeah, you get paid, right? Great. It's not actually about the money for me. Um, it's about a couple of other things that are a bit more nuanced. It's about having time to give a shit about the project. And I spoke about this in my Brisbane um, talk on the what goes into a high-end custom WordPress site, that budget, proper budget allows you to have time to think and try things and strategize and percolate. And um, I can't myself and my team work on things if we're just pumped and we've only got half the time we need to do something. We're not gonna do our best work and we just wanna do good work for good people. So I don't want, I wanna leave things better than I found them. It's not about just pumping work through. So for me, budget is not about getting paid as much as it is about having time to care about the outcome. Um, it's also showing that they understand your value, um, which is a big one for me. Um, I, we have a, a list of values in, our, in Pixel Palace, and the first one is we are invested. And I apply that to clients as well. Clients need to be invested in the project and in us as experts and in the outcomes and everything for us to take it on board. And if they are willing to pay and they have decent budget for the project, then that shows that they actually understand the value. Secondly, good clients have good communication skills and they're responsive and respectful. Um, so if I get a sense that they're not going to communicate well, next. Um, good clients are invested in the project and in you as an expert. Good clients know what they want and or if they don't, which is fine, they're happy to be advised and confident in your ability to advise them. Um, there is nothing worse. Obviously, everyone's probably been there. And clients who oh, I don't, I'm, I know, I don't know what I want, but I know what I don't want, especially when I see it. Um, that stuff. No. Um, again, uh, in uh, in my book, not going to be a good client. And then they get bonus points for being fun. So one of our other values at Pixel Palace is we have fun, um, and. Uh, they get bonus points if it's someone that I would like to go for a beer with. Also, as a caveat to that, they get points if they swear a little bit and we can swear a little bit in front of them. Like, it needs to be a relaxed, fun, friendly relationship, um, especially on some of these bigger projects. Um, I have this joke that it's kind of like choosing a baby daddy <laughs> or having a baby with someone um, because you've got to get this thing out into the world and you want to see it do well and you want that relationship to be good between the parents um, in order for that thing to come and... and be as awesome as it possibly can. Further to that, so red flags, client red flags. Does anyone have any red flags? Have you got a list of red flags? Yep. Do you want to yell it out? Anyone? Your brother's a web designer. Oh, I love that one. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yep, yep. What about they, they're slow in paying a deposit? Yes, yes. Can you give me a discount? Yes, yeah, <laughs> right. Exactly. So we have a list of red flags. The first one is, if the first question is how much will it cost? And again, not because I'm all about the money. I'm not. I'm about if you're driven by price and you're shopping on price and you, you're not caring about an outcome, you're not caring about a relationship, you don't see the value in this, you literally just want to buy something off the shelf and we are not going to be the people for you if that's the case. Um, if they don't want to get on a phone call is another one for me. Um, if you don't want to talk to me, no one wants to get on the phone. Even I don't want to answer a phone call, but sometimes, especially at the beginning of a project, we're trying to get a quote to someone, I want to talk to you probably several times before we're giving you that quote. If they take ages to respond, that, that includes paying as well, but even before that, like in the initial inquiry, if they inquire, we fire back a thing and they take too long, they've already got one red flag against their name in our book. It's okay at the very beginning, but if they're too slow repetitively in that first bit, I'm like, this is not gonna work. 
They have multiple horror stories of previous service providers who've wronged them. Oh my God, 10 minutes, I gotta go. And they take no responsibility. Um, and this last one, they're too excited or too emotional. My team laughed their heads off at this and it's a weird one, but in my experience, true. Like we have people that are like, oh my God, I'm so excited to work with you. you we're so aligned and they almost cry and I start going, oh my God, <laughs> no. Or if you, they weep when you send them the first designs, I've had that and that, that happened and like, fuck yeah, that's kind of swearing type thing, right? And that, I ended up sacking that client three months down the track because they were so crazy they just were like whoa so too emotional too excited done um, this idea of ringing versus ringing choosing clients that are well aligned with you is super important so identify when you're ringing which is resonant and feels good and awesome and magic happens versus ringing um, because the longer you're trying to ring something over the course of a project um, the more painful that's going to be number four let's talk about value I saw this awesome quote. I don't know who did it, but I've adopted it as my own. I don't charge by the hour, I charge by the awesome, which makes me expensive, but also, and this is critical, awesome. Um, and like, that's, that's so exactly right. It's that time to give a, give a shit thing. So hourly, bill, uh, hourly billing burns the social dynamic, in my experience. Um, the psychology of a relationship between you and a client will be materially different if it's based on hourly pricing than it will be if it's based on an outcome or continuity or project pricing. When people pay you by the hour, clients uh, intend to obsess over what you're doing every hour um, and they're not focused on the net effect that you're having on them, which is the really important thing. And that often leads to really unreasonable expectations um, and the desire to micromanage. So, um, yeah, moving away from hourly pricing and starting to focus on outcomes. And the other bit is this, like, understanding the psychology of value. So um, there's a great analogy that's been around for a while about the guy that goes to the dentist. The dentist goes, you need two fillings. Um, I've got time to do one now. Let's do it, and we'll book you in for the next one next week. So he does it, and the dude goes to pay. And then he's like, oh, my God, this is super expensive. So how dare you charge me that much? That took you 20 minutes, and you were just able to do it. And the dentist went, well, that's fine. I can take two hours to do the second one next week if it makes you feel better. And that's kind of this psychology of value. Like, as you get better and more experienced, you're going to be quicker and better and more awesome quickly. So why should you only get paid by the time it takes you? That's not what people are paying for. So... Um, Hourly pricing means someone gets screwed. It's either you or the client. It's not good for anyone. So moving away from that. And then this idea changed my entire freelancing business back in, I probably read it 10 years ago from the amazing Seth Godin. He has this quote about um, the benefit of the doubt, which is the patient responds to medicine when he believes the doctor who prescribes it and the client's far more likely to applaud your work if he's already put down a big non-refundable deposit. <laughs> A huge part of making our work more effective is creating the environment where we will be given the benefit of the doubt. Often creating this environment is at least as important as the work itself. The benefit to both sides is huge. Doubt is a project killer and investing in diminishing that doubt is time well spent. Now, the important bit about this is that I am not in any way saying you use this to get crappy work over the line with a client because the premise of this whole thing is not, I'm assuming that you're doing your very best work no matter what level you're at or what you're charging. This is not about manipulation. This is about, you do, if you provide the same exact deliverable and you've done your very best, um, but, and I switched to doing a 50% deposit up front when I read this, the minute I read it, I was like, changed from my 10% to 50 10 years ago. You present the same design to a client, someone who's paid a $10,000 deposit up front and is waiting to see the deliverable to approve it to move to the next stage. How do you think they're going to think wanting? Or how do you think they're going to be feeling about that deliverable before they see it? They're going to want to like what they're going to see. They have paid a big chunk of money. They're not going to want to pick it apart. They don't want to feel like an idiot. So you've removed some doubt. If they've paid 10% or nothing before they have to approve something from you, what do you think they're going to do? They're going to nitpick to get every cent of value out of you to, before they have to fork over the next big chunk of money. So in terms of client psychology management, this was a huge one. Number five, boundaries. Weirdly, people will like you more when you set boundaries. People like me more than some of my team because I'm the one that comes in and goes, nah. Um, and the team will have like been, oh, okay, you know, oh, I'm not sure, blah, blah. No, boundaries, people like you more. Um, again, amazing Brene Brown. She talks a lot about this. 
Um, but boundaries are about training clients how they need to behave with you. Uh, so things like don't answer emails, calls, or texts on the weekend. No, oh my God. Um, <laughs> respond promptly and communicate clearly. Like demonstrate the behavior that you want to see back from them shows you have boundaries. Have a conversation at the start of a project about these rules and how to get the best out of the relationship. People, when I say this to other people, they think I'm nuts that I do this. I do this with every client that comes on board. Um, I have a conversation that is understand that the team energy and dynamic and the culture here and how we feel about a project is super important to me and everyone and it should be to you because it's like kombucha. Like, if you keep us, if everything stays nice and happy and healthy and we communicate well, it doesn't mean we have to agree, but we communicate well, the project is going to be awesome. You will get our very best work. But if you start firing emails that are all caps with no high and screaming unreasonable things at us over email, the whole team's going to start shutting down, stepping back, and you're not going to get the best outcome. So understand that that's how this works around here. Um, payment up front, so that whole payment thing, deposit, not releasing things until they've paid. We don't launch unless they've paid their thing in full, stuff like that. Um, showing them we have systems and processes in place and explaining why. And this is a big one, being prepared to walk away. Um, this can be hard, especially if you're struggling to get work and you're um, maybe by yourself or you, yeah, you're just trying to build a business. Um, but it's extremely powerful having the energy behind your intention that you're prepared to walk away from something that doesn't align with your values and is not respectful of your boundaries. Um, you make space for better clients when you do that. And again, just quickly, another, I love Seth. Seth, you need to follow Seth. Um, who gets your best work? It's like if you reserve your best effort for the irritable boss, the never pleased client, and the bully of a customer, then you've bought into a system that rewards the very people who are driving you nuts. It's no wonder you have clients like that, because they get your best work. On the other hand, when you make it clear and then deliver on the promise that your best work goes to those that are clear, respectful, and patient, you become a specialist in having clients just like that. Amazing. So true. Um, and just a tip on this one, a practical tip, because my talk was practical. Uh, boomerang for Gmail is really good. If you're a freelancer and you work all hours and you've just got to get stuff done, trying not to send emails out of hours to people, Boomerang's a free thing on Gmail. If you haven't got it, you can just schedule that it sends, um, like 9 a.m. the next day or whatever. But some sort of scheduling app for email is a good idea. Scope creep, oh my god. So the biggest <laughs> issue in the whole industry um, is scope creep. And Oh, God, I laughed at that picture. Um, my, my whole team well, I think, especially as a freelancer, when you're on your own, everyone wants to people please, and there's no one to back you up, and you overpromise to get the job sometimes, and then clients don't understand what you do, and they're getting angry, because some people get angry when they don't understand, and that whole thing, and there's resentment both sides, and it's all just bad, right? Like, it's freelancer hell. It's actually agency hell as well. It's hard. Scope creep is hard. Um, but I've actually got really good at managing scope creep. So some of the things that we do to manage scope creep are that we take time to scope things properly before quoting. Um, so we do very, very detailed quotes on everything. So very, very clear. Um, we ask lots of questions prior to quoting. So often when, a, when we're getting ready to do a quote, I will call someone so many times, uh, we will email so many times with so many questions, and I can't tell you the amount of times the client will go, None of the other companies have asked any of these questions. Like, what? And I'm like, well, what are they doing? They're like, I don't know. So it's an amazing sales technique as well, right? But it's also protecting you. So later on, when they try and suggest some crazy thing that they thought was included, um, that didn't come up in the hundred questions we asked you about all the things. Is there anything else? Is there anything else? Is there anything else? That's out of scope. So um, it gives you power. Nip it in the bud early. It's like mold. Scope creep is like mold. You can't leave any of it. So as soon as it starts happening, you have to identify it and go, like, we need to deal with this. And dealing with it doesn't mean you say no. You can still even do it, but you need to communicate that you're doing it. So you need to communicate discounts and extras that you're throwing in really clearly as you go. Um, I know we've made the mistake lots of times, even up until the last couple of years, of just doing the little bits that the client asks for because it's easy. But those bits are the bits that give you power later on when they want something massive and they're angry because they don't understand. You can go, look at all the things I told you as we went, we've added. And this is clearly out of scope because you didn't tell us at the beginning and it's not in the quote. So communicating that all the way through is important, though. 
quote for all out of scope work, even if you're prepared to do it for free. Again, I'm not saying you have to charge for it. That's fine, but they need to know what they're getting so they understand. Um, and then this tip, this is a Jennyism that, yeah, my team thinks it's hilarious. Get practiced at serving a shit sandwich. Now, a shit sandwich is, I'm sorry, I'm a swearer for anyone who is offended by um, language things, but um, positive, bad news, positive, right? So um, an example of a shit sandwich would be, I've got to stop, would be um, client asks for something crazy, you go, that's a great idea. I actually think it'll be fantastic and your audience would really like that. It's going to add 30 hours and $5,000 to the quote and the scope, um, but we think you'll get ROI on that. It's a great idea. So um, <laughs> if you'd like us to proceed with that, let us know and we'll work out how we can fit into the current schedule and we'll get cracking on it for you. Happy, bad news, happy. What that does is you're not saying no, but you put it back on them. You're very clear that this is my boundaries, this was the scope, this is what we're doing. You can do it, it's your choice now. And if they were thinking you were going to include it, they feel like an idiot because of that. Um, if they get angry, you've communicated clearly and it's fair. I'm meant to stop, but you've got to have rules. So act like an agency even if you're not. Take the choice out of it for yourself and it becomes how the business rolls. So have project management, deadlines. I have project kill dates. You know when the client disappears at the end of a project right when their last invoice is due um, because they know they've got to pay and then suddenly they don't really care if the website doesn't go live for another two months? No, we, sent, we have a kill date that says if you, we're finished. We're finished and you pay us. So things like that. Counting systems, clearly defined operating hours, Pay yourself a set wage each week. If you're a freelancer, a business coach told me this years ago, um, auto transfer, set an amount, let it automatically go across to your personal account. What that does is it forms a habit, it sets a minimum threshold for your value and it um, allows funds to pool in the business too, which then gives you some choice later on when you want to walk away from a bad client or pick a client. So you can um, increase the amount as you build, but um, doing it that way, it saves you from being desperate when you get to um, a client that you don't want to work with. So just the takeaways are people and comms is massively important. You can be the best designer or coder in the universe, but if you can't communicate, you're going to struggle. Ego and empathy, listen well and take feedback. Use empathy and leave your ego out of it. Working with clients who are well aligned means you'll be ringing rather than ringing, so get picky. Um, value, doubt's a project killer, so invest in diminishing doubt in every way you can. Boundaries are massively important. Promise that your best work goes to those that are respectful and you'll get customers that are like that. And then have rules and get really, really good at delivering shit sandwiches. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jen. I think we have time for a couple of questions and I hope everyone is ready to begin their ascent to client heaven. Um, put your hand up if you have a question and we'll run a microphone to you. Have you got any tips on dealing with those sort of time blockers, you know? Oh, can I just have a quick question, the ones that call up? Yeah. Um, we, so, yeah, we try and avoid phone stuff, as in have, we don't have a number that people can call. Uh, there's mobiles. Um, I just really early, that's part of that conversation at the beginning of a project or any new client that comes on board with us. That's one of the things we're like, understand that we'd rather keep feedback or questions to a set time. We try and make um, intervals where we'll do a Google Hangouts with the client mid-project and stuff like that. Um, it is tough. I think there's a balance between great customer service because I think being super responsive yeah. keeps clients happy as well, but keep it contained to a... Um, like yes, they can be. But it's, it, that's boundaries though, right? Like if you set up boundaries and you're clearing your boundaries, they stop being leeches and they like you more, which is the weird, conversely odd thing about that one. Yeah. Hi, thanks for the talk, Jen. That's all right. Um, <clears throat> just uh, agree with all your stuff about being picky about clients and everything. Uh, but what's the best way to find the balance with that when you're starting out and you're quite desperate for clients? Yeah, I think it's, <laughs> I think it's like starting out, and I definitely did a lot of, 
Oh, I mean, I also do think some of this stuff when you're starting is like, I can stand here and tell you this, but sometimes you just need to feel the real burn to learn. Um, <laughs> so I let some of my younger team learn the burn badly themselves with clients um, just for the fun of it, for them to learn. Um, but I think it's about, I think all of this applies no matter what level you're at. So the, and again, the boundaries and the value stuff, like even if you're not charging a huge amount because you're only just starting and you're trying to get clients, even if you're working for free for a client, like I think that's fine, building portfolio, that's what you do. Um, but all of those things like the value and just because they're not, because they're not paying you, it's a little bit of a recipe for disaster, right? Because they don't already, there's not going to be a lot of value attached. So they aren't going to, no matter what, it's like the, the budget part of that, that value piece is the bit. Um, people that are, when they're not paying for it, they don't really care, even, and especially friends and family seem to be the worst at this. Um, like, they just don't really value you, and it feels like they should, and then it's even more hurtful, right, because they don't. But I think it's that communicating, if you go into that relationship and you're doing it for free, communicate up front, this is fraught with danger. This is fraught with, I want this to be good, but understand that I'm doing something for free to you. This would be worth this much. I need you to behave like this for this to work. These are the rules. This is how it's going to roll. We're going to run this like blah, blah, blah. Treat those clients like they're paying $50,000 for the thing, even if they're only paying nothing or $500. Um, all, I think all those rules that I spoke about still apply. Yeah, communication. That's it. Great talk, Jen. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, we run a plug-in business, so we're probably in a different price point from where you are. But do you have any comments about how to deal with international clients, particularly those that sort of put their messages through Google Translate before it arrives? Oh, uh, God. I don't... Uh, to be inbox? honest, uh, that would be, like, that's hard, and I don't have an answer. I wouldn't work with them, only because, like, we... I just... I pick who we work with, and that would just be a too hard basket for me. Well, that's a hard one for you, yeah, though. Fair <laughs> yeah. Ooh. Just a quick question on invoicing. Um, like, if customers start out really good, pay really regularly, and then things start getting bad to worse to worse, how do you kind of... Where's the point of when you should really challenge to say, fix up the invoice? Uh, I am quick on that, too. That, again, for me, is that boundaries thing. Like, you, this is how you... If you want to work with us... And I have sacked... I did sack a major client in Brisbane this year because I got sick of... They need... They would... They were... They're a big name, especially in Brisbane. They would... I would get crying phone calls from the marketing manager at 7 p.m. on my mobile because something was, she'd broken something. They were high maintenance. They obviously had a horrible culture in their actual business and they wouldn't pay invoices for like four months. So I just, in the end, sent an email and said, forget it, we're done. We're not doing this anymore, we're out. And so, because you, if you get, it's the Seth thing. Like if you're gonna behave like that, um, that it sets an energetic tone for the rest of my business too. Um, so I think as soon as they stop paying, I send an email saying you need to pay. Um, I will call and I will keep calling until they pay. Um, you can do it with a shit sandwich, um, but like it is, it's the, just being very clear on your boundaries and not just taking it because you have to, because you make room for something better. So yeah. I'll just... We can probably get away with one more question, maybe two if you're quick. I can answer quick. Hi. Hi. Uh, one area in which I and many people are weak is actually preparing the invoices. Yes. You know, very enthusiastic at doing the work, but just hate Really? The See, I love invoicing. <laughs> I have this thing, I'm like, Mama loves to invoice. <laughs> the team, no. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, do you have any recommendations for, you know, services or software to automatically do the, yeah. you know, hour logging and... Uh, yeah, so we use, um, we use Harvest um, and we use Xero. Um, but to be fair, because we work project-based mostly um, or retainer work for big clients for that we do full strategic marketing, like digital plug-in, um, it's all automated either in repeating invoices in Xero or um, thing else. So I'm, we're not, we don't do little bits and pieces, like we don't just do your social media, we don't just do a deliverable design thing. It's like 50% deposit, 30% progress, 20%. And I get paid because we don't move if you don't pay so you don't get your stuff so I don't have that many problems around invoicing because of that but I would definitely say zero is um, the best thing out there it integrates with everything thanks yeah. Yeah. one more just talk 1.5 times speed sorry please. I'm trying to talk as quickly <laughs> as possible um, great talk by the way thanks but 
sounds like a lot of your work is like one-on-one -on -one with the client. How much of it do you automate to, to make it more? Um, some of the dev process setup stuff is sort of automated, but no, we're very custom. Like, we really, everything is custom designed, built. Um, all of the strategic marketing, like we, we're not, we're not, like us, we're not, we don't charge by the hour, we charge by the awesome, like we charge by outcome. Um, so, you know, our sites start at 20 grand up to 100 grand for a WordPress site. So it's not, um, yeah, it's sort of, it is one-on-one -on -one because we have time, it's that back again to value and having time, that, that price point gives us time to give a shit and to care. I can plug in and the team, every, our whole team of nine have eyes on a project. So we work on a couple of things at a time and everyone's all on it. So it is very, very personalised. Um, that's how I want to do business though. Um, that's, yeah. I think cool. probably better Thank you very up. much, Jen. No worries. Thank you.